thank you very much for the introduction and for the invitation. Um, so it's the same Johnny Evans. Um, so uh, as motivation, uh, the overarching question is, uh, suppose you just have F some singularity. Uh, let's just say we're specifying to an isolated hypersurface singularity. Um, with, say, Milner number mu. And Milner fiber M sub F. So you can look at the versal or mini-versal deformation space for F. Good gosh. where, say, you have a point eta, which I think of as you know, the linear combination of polynomials. These are polynomials that are a basis for the mini-vessel deformation space. And above it, you have the hypersurface F plus E two equals zero. And this setup gives a map from ah, I forgot. Inside here you have the discriminant locus for F. Which is a set of all points such that this rather intersected with some large ball is singular. And this gives you a map from pi 1 of the complement of the discriminant locus to by looking at the monodromy reaction on the smooth fiber pi naught of the space of compactly supported symplectomorphisms of the Milner fiber. Because this, whenever a fiber is smooth here, it's a copy of the Milner fiber. Um, and this action is given by vanishing cycle, um, by Dane twists in vanishing cycles. So, Dane twists on vanishing, in vanishing cycles, on vanishing cycles. Um, where the way to see the Dane twist is just if you take uh, something that sort of hides the highest dimensional stratum in the discriminant locus, that's just a family of A1 singularities, and the monodromy around an A1 singularity is a Dane twist in a vanishing cycle. Um, so the sort of overarching motivational question is to try to understand what sort of a representation of this fundamental group this map gives you. Also, I know it's a large lecture hall, but feel free to cut in and ask questions. So, obviously this is a very vague question also, and so what we're looking at is uh, specializing to a function of two variables, possibly uh, stabilized, 
which means that you've added just squares of extra variables. Um, and in this case, um, well, there's various flavors of Fouquet categories associated to this singularity, um, but a lot of them have very nice descriptions uh, thanks to largely an algorithm of a compo. I'm going to need a new board. Give me a second. So I'm going to do all of this for a particular example of a singularity, but hopefully the sort of general technique and the general kind of object you get out of it are going to be clear. Uh, so I'm going to use the example of x4 plus y4. And notice that this has Milner number 4 minus 1 times 4 minus 1, so 9. OK, so the input for this algorithm is you just look at a real morsification of this function. So if you rearrange things there, what you have is a product of four lines. So a real morsification Well, here's an example uh, where what I've drawn is the zero locus. And I'm thinking of this as living in the real xy plane. So x is the standard variable going one way, y would be the standard variable going the other way. Uh, and this is just the zero locus of the polynomial thought of as a real function. So what does that tell you? about critical points of the polynomial over C. Well, wherever I have a crossing, for instance, here, that means that locally it looked like x prime, y prime equals 0. So in, for the real function, this is you know, two variable calculus. I have a saddle. Uh, but for the complex function, that's still some kind of critical point. Just there's no longer a signature. So whenever I see a crossing, I have one critical point, or, which is a real saddle. So altogether, there's six of them here. And then whenever there's an enclosed area, like these polygons, well, if you think again back to two-variable calculus, if you graph your real function somewhere above or below this region, it reaches a maximum or a minimum. So say it reaches at least one maximum. And then next door, at least one minimum, one minimum. Well, again, over the complex numbers, at the very least, I have still, the, I mean, there's still critical points just now. You can't tell there's no signature. So just by looking at this diagram, 
we can give a lower bound on the number of critical points that must exist. One for each of the crossings and one for each of the areas. But when I sum that up, I already see nine critical points. And I know that the Miller number is nine, so there's got to be exactly nine. Um, so, a compo calls this, can I write this far down? Great, thanks, let me try. A good real deformation. Uh, and what that means is you already see from this graph all of the critical points. Um, and moreover, he shows that given a two variable singularity, you can always get one of these. Okay, so suppose you start, you have this. Now, with this as your input data, we're going to be able to describe the Milner fiber of F together with a collection of vanishing cycles. So, how does that work? Well, for each of these saddle type points, I'm going to put in a cylinder. Let me draw it first and then comment. So what's going on here? Well, I've left spaces between them, but so far, whenever I have a crossing, I'm putting in a little piece of surface that I'm thinking of as a cylinder, sort of where I'm looking above it, so I sort of stretched with the top edge of the cylinder one way and the bottom edge the other way to embed it or immerse it into the plane like this. Uh, so since another piece would be here and here. Um, and now, following, so that takes care of all of the intersections on this graph. And now, for each of the edges, I put in a strip with a half twist. And notice that the, the sign of the half twist that changes the sort of local embedding, but it's not changing the surface. So what I've got here is a description of the complex surface fxy equals 1. So here, x to the 4 plus y to the 4 equals 1, um, where the sort of embedding that it naturally comes presented with sort of has a ton of boundary um, in terms of you know, the way the boundary gets stretched out. Uh, so that describes for you the surface. And we also, a compass algorithm also gives you a description of the vanishing cycles. So with this mulsification, uh, if you think of your function fxy going well, from C2 
down to C, well, there's a bunch of critical points at zero. Let me say this is the real axis. Then there's the positive critical points and negative ones. And if you choose the most natural vanishing cycles, so just going straight like this, then, so if you choose the most natural vanishing path, so these straight line segments, then the vanishing cycles are given as follows. So for the saddle, you just take the original curve of the S1 that you put in. Is this visible? The green that kind of looks white? No. no. Okay. I'm gonna upgrade to a different color. How's purple? Equally rubbish. Okay, there's this small, there's, uh, we have the small color chalk as well. Maybe some of it is better. Is this better? Looks better here. Thicker. What? It's thicker. Actually, this is the thinner chalk, Ivan. <laughs> um, So these, and now for the positive, for the uh, critical points that corresponded to real either maxima or minima, is something up? Yeah, it goes around the cylinder. So it's the, the waste curve on the cylinder. I mean, the only non-trivial curve on the cylinder. Yes. This is, so in, great. So this is, this is the, this complex plane. And if you want to specify vanishing cycles, you need to pick a smooth point, which is this one, and then paths from the critical points to the smooth point, from the critical values to the smooth point. But with this particular morsification, well, it's not quite a mortification because I had, well, technically with this picture, six uh, critical values that were zero. I have one positive one. I'd put three for illustration because in general you could have more. And I have two negative ones. So they're on, they're on the real axis. Uh, and I pick, or a couple picks, uh, you know, negative pure imaginary uh, smooth point. And then these are, the these are the vanishing paths. So they're the, sort of the natural things you would write down, the straight line segments. And I'm telling you what the corresponding vanishing cycles are in this Riemann surface. So this Riemann surface you can think of as the fiber above this point. And then if you were to deform it down to here, the curves that get contracted are uh, the ones in Impressionistic yellow. We picked what? Well, to draw the middle picture, first I drew the Riemann surface. No, the Riemann surface was just associated to this graph. I mean, a, any smooth set. level set would be the same. But it, it, is the, it is the level set that's close to zero. 
Yeah. Either, you know, positive real or negative yeah. real. Speak up. Uh, yeah, I rewrote it to have the product of four real lines rather than complex numbers. I, I said that, but I didn't write it down. But they're equivalent. Questions are great. Any more? All right, you can save them. Uh, so I've told you what the vanishing cycles are corresponding to the saddle points. Uh, if I, now I need to tell you about the other kinds of points. So what you do for that is you just take the curve that sort of goes around this corresponding region, sort of hugging it around. Uh, I hope the blue's visible. Joe's happy. Um, and if you're thinking back to Dimitri's level set story, uh, it makes sense intuitively that you'd get these curves because what's going on is basically, well, if you think of it in the real picture, in the real picture above this, you have a little disk uh, with the maximum on the point of that disk. And that disk is Lagrangian. And its boundary is also here. And then that would give you the vanishing disk, the vanishing symbol. OK, so this board is certainly decorated enough. Uh, but does anyone have questions? I missed a piece about this algorithm. Yes? Um, how do you decide at each of the saddle points if you have like an over or under problem? Oh, I guess I said that just verbally. There's no, you don't decide. It's just a question, like, what I'm telling you here implicitly is an embedding in R3. But that's, that's not special. Um, you do have to decide, you know, once and for all, you know, what, you know, there's two possible orientations. And there's a way of deciding what the orientation is. But I wasn't going to go into that. Um, and if you flip the orientation, that's sort of equivalent to flipping max and min. And I haven't gone into that anyway. OK. Thanks, Tim. All right, so given this, so this which is geometric, I can in, in, encode sort of more combinatorially. So let me do that now. So, haha, yellow. Ditching this. So, Now I'm going to write big fat dots for the vanishing cycles. Uh, I'm keeping the same color. Now, I'm going to draw lines between them if they touch. <coughs> um, and if the way this picture is set up, what you naturally have, it's not just a graph, you have this planar graph where you naturally start, because you started with a planar thing here, and you got this out of it. And now, the triangles here, OK, I am going to go for green. Uh, so if we look, for instance, at this triangle here, well, that's a geometrically significant thing. It's this triangle. Maybe I'll enlarge this. What I have here is I have a piece of surface. And 
and I have a triangle. So if I was to, if I were to look at the directed Foucault category of F, well, I have a mu2 between these three points. Uh, and what the order is comes back to Tim's question, which is what the orientation of this, whether this, the orientation here is the same orientation as a blackboard or the flipped orientation. But certainly that alternates as you go from one triangle to the next. So let's say this orientation, then this one, then this one, then this one. And so what's the directed Foucault category either of F or of F possibly stabilized? Well, you have generators, these dots, which are vanishing cycles. Then the lines give morphisms of rank one, uh, respecting the, the coloring. So blue maps to, well now it's yellow maps to red. So these give morphisms uh, just of rank one. And whenever you have one of these triangles, you have a mu2 product. So this picture essentially encodes the geometry completely, and moreover, the category is very combinatorial, given that. Can I ask why is mu2 associative? Why is mu2 associative? It's always associative. No, okay. Oh, okay. How do you see it just from the combinatorics? What? Yeah. I mean, you can only go, you can go from here to here. You can go from this bunch to this bunch. You can go from this bunch to this bunch. You can go from this bunch to this bunch, and that's it. Great. Now I need the tripping device again. Moreover, um, there's a result of Paul, which says that if I took, now I take the Fouquet category of the Milner fiber, where I stabilized at least twice, uh, and I look inside it at the full subcategory on the vanishing cycles. Maybe I'll call this capital F, um, which often gets called BF. Then this is 
Aha, I knew I would do this. We call this A, following Paul's notation. This is a trivial extension of categories of A and the dual of A, N is the dimension. Uh, the, or sorry, the dimension of the, the spheres. Uh, but the upshot is we can still describe the full category or the full subcategory on the vanishing cycles completely in terms of that diagram. Now each of the dots corresponds to a spherical object instead of an exceptional object. And uh, you have morphisms both ways. And the possible products are given by, well, blue to yellow to red, and also the cyclic rotation. Um, does anyone have questions about this? Either good or bad. Okay. Okay. So back to this question, we wanted to study this uh, representation. So a natural question, the answer, I, I don't know the answer to this question in general, but I have a guess, is what pi one of the complement of the discriminant locus for the case still of a two variable singularity. Um, as a remark, notice that uh, if you stabilize the singularity, the miniversal deformation and the complement discriminant locus don't change. So miniversal deformation and the discriminant locus don't change under st stabilization. So I wanted to give this picture a name. Uh, and I want to be able to point at it anyway, so I'm going to pull it down. If I, haha. So let me call this DF. Now, there's a group associated to DF as follows. So for generators, I put sigma sub i, where i uh, varies over all of the vanishing cycles. And you should think of these as behaving like the Dane twist, like sigma sub i should be morally the Dane twist in the ith vanishing cycle. Uh, and so you probably won't be surprised by the next two relations, the next two things I tell you, which is I want to put relations as follows. Well, if there's no edge between i and j, they commute. If there's an edge, I put in a braid relation. Uh, but now, there's going to be an extra relation whenever you have one of these triangles. Is 
not move. And if there's a triangle, say, with this orientation, with i, j, and k, then I put in the following relation. So sigma i, sigma j, sigma k, sigma i is equal to sigma j, sigma k, sigma i, sigma j. Uh, and using, assuming you've already put in the braid relations uh, for the pairs, that would be, that would also give you sigma k, sigma i, sigma j, sigma k. Okay. Yeah? Okay. Um, so, how should you think about this? Well, morally, I'm thinking of this as coming from the existence of the, the disk that gives you the mu2 product. or I include it because of the disk which gives the mu2 product, or I should say triangle. Um, is if you have such a configuration, Then, locally, if you think of like, your favorite uh, leftist vibration model, uh, a different way different way of having this would be this local picture. where this is now a piece of the standard A3 vibration. And what you see, this is something you have to check, but if you twist the yellow guy back by the red guy, then it doesn't intersect the blue one. So they commute. And this relation is a way of rewriting this commuting relation. So let me just put, um, I don't really want a whole new board for this. Let me think for a second. If you took the commutator of, say, <laughs> if you then twist i back by j, then it commutes with k. in charge, a piece of random piece of blackboard just fell down. What? <laughs> That'll be Nick, okay. Yeah, I think it came from the top, so you need to be tall. So um, we can show that if we take this group G of DF, well, first of all, it, it's independent of 
uh, what you had chosen here. So if you choose different morsifications, you get the same thing. Uh, so in particular, if you start, say you had a crossing like this in your picture with the real morsification, you're allowed to pass this one over here, like this. So it's independent of moves like this. So uh, let me set diagram moves on morsification. Uh, and moreover, it maps subjectively to pi 1 of the discriminant locus complement. Uh, and this is an isomorphism in all of the cases where this is understood. So that's ADE uh, due to Briscorn. And also anything that's Briscorn fam, which in two variables would just be x to the p plus y to the q. And that's due to learn, although with a slightly different description. Um, so what kind of you know, DFs do you see here? Well, for instance, um, E6, which is a favorite of mine, uh, you could have this, uh, in which case the group DF would just be, uh, if you're familiar with the concept, uh, the Art and Teats group associated to this diagram. Um, um, but you could also have a different one for E6, which gives you the same answer. So E6 is x cubed plus y4. And if you look at the morsification that comes from morsifying x and morsifying y, what you naturally end up with is a diagram that looks like this. Uh, but that's the same group as the one you get from here. Uh, and more generally, with xp plus y to the q, uh, then a natural presentation uh, gives you diagrams that look like this. So sort of checkered. And then the signs of the little triangles keep alternating. I heard someone grumbling. You've given up. OK. Um, and any questions? I just said it's the nice example in all the examples we know. My, I would, I would like to prove that it's always a nice morphism, but uh, it's work in progress. If, if we're not stabilized, we know it's a nice morphism. But so, 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 aha, that's a great question. So the point is, this is just pi one of the complement discriminant locus. So it acts on that. I mean, it, I, I should pay you for this question because it brings me to my next point. Um, this, there's a representation of this into pi naught of the symplectic mapping class group. Well, so yes. So far, it doesn't matter. Whether it's <laughs> that's right. That's right. I said that somewhere up there. So because this is independent of the stabilizations of f, it's that that remark in brackets um, <coughs> somewhere in the North Pole. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. No. No. It's great. But but it brings me to my next point. So the, the reason this is such a compelling project is, well, for me, is you have this very nice combinatorial description and things, is, things are formal. You just have the mu2 products. And now this is extremely natural group. And the question is, well, you know, when or in, in what circumstances would it actually act uh, faithfully? So, 
So in the non-stabilized case, there's uh, a relation, there's a theorem of Weinrib, which says that there exists a class alpha in, well, the kernel of the map of the representation you get for E6. So the unstabilized E6, just XQ plus Y4. Um, on the other hand, Paul showed that, uh, by the way, this is the final page of the book, uh, which is an argument, uh, a very compelling argument for reading books all the way to the end. Um, so uh, Paul shows that in, if you stabilize twice, then uh, this class, well, al this, this uh, alpha is no longer in the kernel. Uh, in fact, we checked that if you stabilize once, it's enough. Stabilize once. And morally, what's going on is, well, from a symplectic, Weinrib's was a, is, my Weinrib's paper is a mapping class paper, so he doesn't phrase it in this language. But morally, what's going on from a symplectic perspective is this extra relation is detecting uh, a higher product in the Foucault category, or this, the full subcategory on vanishing cycles. And once you stabilize, well, the category becomes formal, and there is, this relation goes away. Um, so, on the one hand, you have this, uh, and then on the other hand, and I'll probably end with this, uh, one of the things that we can show is, so, if you start with non-stabilized and you stabilize, you have some relations that go away, but at least as a sort of slogan or an expectation, we think we know what's going on. They're the ones that are sort of extra because of uh, infinity products. Uh, on the other hand, if you look the other way, well, we can show that any relation, and let me keep phrasing in terms of kernel, actually. So any, so suppose beta, is in the kernel pi one b so non trivial stabilization. Then Beta is also in the kernel in the lowest dimensional case. I should just rewrite it. So the questions about the statement? No. Yes. Um, I think so, but our proof doesn't readily give that. But I, I would be very surprised if that wasn't the case. Sorry, what was the question? Oh, sorry. The question was uh, whether it would hold for intermediate. So if you'd stabilize three times and the relation holds 
do you know that it really holds when you just stabilize twice? Um, my, and my, my guess is yet, yeah, but yes, but the sort of, that may be something that you could hope comes out in the wash when you understand the bigger picture better. So I didn't try specifically proving it. Um, but you keep asking great questions. Um, okay. I'm actually going to keep this picture just because from past experience people always ask questions about it and then I'm stuck when I've erased it. I'm delete this instead. So in particular, um, in the AN and DN cases, uh, it's known that <coughs> pi one of the complement of the discriminant locus. Um, injects into pi naught sim c mf, uh, where this is just the two variable singularity. This is the Riemann surface. So in the an case, we already knew uh, that there's a faithful an action, but in particular, this already gives you that there's a faithful there are faithful DN actions. Um, in fact, you get a bit more than that because if you see DN subpictures, then you get faithful DN actions on those. Um, Yeah, the, I only have five minutes, so I don't think I should try and explain this. Um, maybe I'll just tell you, wh why are you laughing? Poor request and explanation. Poor request and explanation. Okay, um, it uses tons of work with Paul. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, if I ever make it with these damn boards, I'm sorry. So the key is the key observation, I think morally, is the fact that with this particular configuration of vanishing cycles, they ever, only ever intersect once or, or zero. Um, and now there's this work of yours and Ivan she says that if I had, let me write the symbols and then comment on what I mean since I'm stressed about time. So if I imagine uh, I have some Dane twist, some product of Dane twists in the big VI, and I know that's, iso that's isotopic to the identity in the big picture, I want to show that the product of the little VIs is also isotopic to the identity. 
So what I can get from, well, I have this inequality, but if I know that this is one or zero, then If I know that this is one or zero, then you have to have an equality considering uh, parity. And moreover, you know that you have one or zero here. That basically allows you to place all of these cycles back, apart from worrying about the fact that you could be going around the boundary component or you can have a boundary twist. Uh, but for that, you could cheat. Um, well, I think it's cheating. Uh, because you could say, well, for instance, if you're worried about going around this curve, you could put in, you could look at the symplectomorphism of a bigger uh, Weinstein manifold, Weinstein domain, where you've added, uh, you've done surgery on, you know, what is going to correspond to this curve here. And you still have the symplectomorphism because it's compactly supported. But now you go, you, now, you, that, now that rules out intersecting here because the intersection with this guy is zero. Um, so that's, that's a sketch of proof. Um, and I wanted to, the only thing I wanted to also say, if, for instance, you're a representation theorist or something at heart, is we know tons of things about Coxeter groups and Artin-Tietz groups, uh, which are the groups where when you start with a graph, you add, for an, well, in our world, you would just be adding the commuting and the braiding. This relation looks still pretty natural from the point of view of those groups, but people have never studied this. But now it makes it look like a natural thing to do would be to add you know, triangles or high dimensional simplices in this and that you still have a natural theory. Um, and so part of what I'm doing at the moment is sort of going through the literature on that and trying to understand what might or might not extend. Um, but here's a, here's a class of geometrically arising pretty natural groups that maybe we should think about. Thanks for listening. <laughs>